I'm grateful for the work of the Holy Spirit in this church. And some of you may be very, very familiar with that. And some of you may be less than familiar with that. You say, why is this woman talking in the middle of the worship service? Listen, we believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. And, and the Holy Spirit moves uh, among his people. And he may give a message. In, it may be in tongues and be interpreted. We did a teaching on this not long ago. Um, it may be a prophetic message. It may, it is, but it is always something that will edify the body. Always something that will bring us together. And I am encouraged this morning that God is speaking to us saying, this, let this be the day. Don't wait. Don't wait. So I don't know where you are with the Lord, but I know that God does not speak in vain. And so I really want to encourage you before we leave today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'm just really encouraging you. Would you let this sink in? Hey, Pastor Ben, can you do me a favor? Can you move this? There's a glare off of the, the plate that's making me like go blinder than normal with these cannon lights aimed at my face. <laughs> that's Wow. Uh, now, see, if I had said that, it'd be mean, but he said it about himself, so I guess it's okay. Um, amen. Well, at least you'll never have a bad hair day. I mean, that's good, right? That's something to be said about. Praise the Lord. So we've been on the Pursuit series, and as we're going along in the Pursuit series, of course, we're going through Matthew. And today we're in, the, uh, we're in Matthew chapter 5, verses, I believe it's 13 to 16. And it talks about being salt and light. Now, you guys know these verses. You've heard them before. What could I possibly say about being salt and light that you haven't already heard? And sometimes, I, do you ever do this? Do you ever feel this way? Do you ever read something in the Bible or, or, you know, Christmas time comes around and you think, Easter comes around and you think, wow, they read the same verse every year. Here's the thing. I could read the same scripture a thousand times, a thousand times a thousand, and each time the Holy Spirit quickens it to me. Each time he shows me something different or does something in my heart through that scripture because the word of God does not return void. It's not just words on a page. It's not just like reading your favorite book over and over until finally you say one day, you know, it was my favorite book, but now I'm sick of it. I know it too well. It bores me. The Bible is alive, and there's a difference between it and something else that we read, right? So, do you ever, have you ever asked yourself, and I just want to talk about this uh, today because we're, we're being told to be salt, we're being told to be light, and, and, and pursue the purpose that God has for us. And do you ever ask yourself, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? Uh, what am I doing here? You know, um, to really make a significant change in my family, in my, in my world. Do you ever ask yourself that? Why am I here? Why am I here? What am I here for? Uh, in my 20s, I worked in various positions that were shift jobs. I was paying for schooling and doing all this. And one of the jobs was in a hospital. And uh, it was third shift. So I'd get there late evening, all night long, right? I'd do my thing. And, uh, and there were some lifers there. How many of you know what I'm talking about? People worked in, they're lifers. They, they come in they, and, they, and, they, and they walk like lifers. Dun, 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 dun. They, I, don't know, I don't know where you've worked. This is where I worked at the hospital. They'd get in. They'd punch their card. They'd go get their coffee. Hey, hey, Bob. Hey, John. You know, lifeless. They've been there 10, 20 years, and you're like, man, this is depressing, right? But that's not to say the job made them that way because there were a few there that had been there 10, 20 years who were perfectly happy who had perfect peace and joy in their heart because they knew the Lord. There's a big difference. So, you know, I, believe it or not, you can become a lifer as a Christian too. You can become a lifer as a Christian too. You go to church, you go through the motions, you do your thing, you've seen it all before, but there is a lack somehow of pizzazz in your spirit. I didn't say lack of pizzas. I said lack of pizzazz in your spirit. Something, something isn't like it used to be, even though you've been saved many, many years, been going to church a long time. You used to be awake. You used to be on fire. And now, dun, 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 dun. well, how did that happen, do you think? Okay, so let me move on. Uh, you know, here's the thing. There's no greater satisfaction, there's no greater contentment than to do what God calls us to do and if I'm not doing what God's called me to do, then I'm not going to be content. Not truly. If I'm not doing, let me say that again. If we, who are called by his name with our task, with our purpose, if we do not do what God has called us to do, we will never 
actually truly be content and fully happy and satisfied. We talk about being self-actualized last week, right? That big word by Maslow, the pyramid of knowing who you are and all of that. You'll never actually be at peace and happy and content and full of that pizzazz until you realize this is what God is calling me to do and I'm doing it. You will be just shy of happiness forever until you get that through our heads. God, what do you want me to do? And then I'm going to do it. That's true. That's true. Now, um, listen, there's no greater satisfaction than God moving in our life. And, and here's the thing. You, Pastor, I, you know, I, I'm not depressed or anything. I'm, I think I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm all right. I mean, I'm, I'm not in the doldrums like you're describing, but I don't know that I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. Well, that's because everyone needs something called homeostasis. What does that mean? Well, it means, it means we want our world to make sense. Look the word up later. Whatever. Here's what it means. Here's what I'm trying to say. You may not be doing what God has called you to do, and you're not, you're not a miserable heap, but you're not quite completely happy and satisfied either. Just say, I'm not depressed. I think I'm okay. You can convince yourself that all is well. You need the sense, there, there's, there's this state of, I have to make my world make sense. And so even if I'm not honoring God, I will progressively get used to the fact that uh, I'm okay the way it is. I don't want anything more. Don't rock the boat. Don't change it. There's a problem with that kind of thinking. There's a problem with that kind of thinking. It, it just, then we're just, it's just a waiting game. Life becomes a waiting game. Life becomes, well, I guess I'll wait till I die. See what happens then. It becomes a waiting game. If you haven't said, God, I, I, I want more. If you haven't said that lately, we should start saying that. Lord, I want more. God, I want more. Here's what I need you to do right now. I need everybody to stand up real quick. Now everybody's getting nervous. I want everybody to raise your right hand. I know this is my left. I'm just trying to help you out. Go like this. And if there's a person next to you, pat them gently on the back. I see some of you spouses, not with a closed fist. Stop strike. Just, and say, and say to them, hey, I pray God blesses you. Okay. Do you know what you've just done? Some of you are still swinging. Stop. Just stop. Just, it's, I said a pat on the back. Okay, you can sit down. What have I started? You know what? Okay, new, we're going we're gonna to do this at the next event we have. We're going to get those giant boxing gloves. And just evidently, we need to duke it out in here. So we'll let that happen. But not, not here, not today. You know what you've just done? You've encouraged somebody next to you. You've just been used by God. God just used you to encourage someone. I can't tell you how many times people in here, in this room, have come up to me and said, man, that was, I appreciate your word. I appreciate what you, and, they, and they, it just lifts me up. It, it encourages me. And we got a bunch of encouragers. I love it. You know what? One of the best hugs I ever receive is from Peter Brescia right there. I'm just going to call you out right now. It's just such an encouraging thing. I, and there's, believe me, there's a lot more than just him. But I'm, since I'm looking in this direction, I, listen, there's nothing, there's nothing sweeter than people that are encouragers and uplifters and they say good things. And then there's the opposite. And then there are those people that couldn't say an encouraging word if their life depended on it. And that's sad because God has a purpose for every person in this room and part of it is to encourage each other somehow, however that is. So last week in the Beatitudes, we talked about what we needed to do to be blessed, remember? That we kind of have this formula of what God gives us uh, to do that, that would bless us in our, in our life. We, we went over them. I won't say them all, but the meek inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are filled. The merciful are shown mercy. The pure in heart see God. <clears throat> the peacemakers will be called the children of God, etc. He gave us things to do to be blessed. Today, it's not that so much. It's not so much what we do, but who we are to the world that's watching us, and they are watching us. Hey, aren't you that girl that used to go to that church? Yeah. Aren't you that guy that used to do such and such? Yeah, they're watching you. Aren't your parents involved in this and that and the other thing? And I don't mean this to be negative, uh, but they're, I, just, they're watching you. They're watching, people are watching you. Especially if you go to church regularly today, 
They're listening to every word you say. You're under a magnifying glass, whether you think it or not. They, they are waiting and watching. And the minute you slip up, ah And I'm sorry to say that that's true, but that's the world we live in. They're watching you, the people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people that are in your family, your relatives. You cannot walk one way and act one way on Sunday and a different way during the week. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? So who are you? Who are we in Christ? What are we? What makes us different from the world? Jesus used these two very emphatic statements to tell us who we are. We are salt and we are light. Now, very quickly, just one word answers, please. Short. What item do you know of that is made completely different just by, and I'm talking about food because I am who I am. What food item, what would you say, this is the thing without salt? One word answers, real quick. What do you have to have a little salt? What? French. French. Ah, amen. What else? Somebody said meat. Meat. Hard-boiled egg. Absolutely. You take a piece of grilled fish and you grill it. It's okay. It tastes kind of grilled, but there's nothing. But add a little pinch of salt, right? Avocado. Avocado's fantastic. It has to have just a pinch of salt and all that nutty, beautiful fruitfulness comes out, right? This is not a cooking show. Just bear with me. There is a point. There is a point behind the fact that God uses salt as one of the things we're supposed to be. Why? Because it flavors everything. Now, some of you are salivating as we speak. That's all right. Listen, there is an ancient Roman uh, expression, this cliche. There's nothing, and, and it goes like this. There's nothing more useful than salt and sunshine. Now, it's an old expression, been reinterpreted a couple billion times, I'm sure. There's nothing more useful than salt and sunshine. Let's consider some of the redeeming qualities of salt, shall we? If you think that, uh, here's the thing. It, it, it does make things more flavorful. Salt adds spice. It adds seasoning. And, and it adds excitement to what it is you're eating. I don't know, like growing up, for example, in, in school, and I don't know what school you go to or, or what their cafeteria food was like, but it was almost as if they had, they had decided in, the, in their hearts behind a closed faculty room door that all food fed to children ought to taste awful and have not a lick of salt in it, and it was bland, and it was boring. And salt is supposed to season, it's supposed to flavor. So now let's apply that, let's apply that to life as a Christian. It's supposed to add seasoning, it's supposed to add flavor. When people say to me, they're afraid that to live as a Christian, it's boring, I will say, you're not doing it right. You're missing something huge. It's not working. Because a life lived as a Christian is not bland. Amen? It's not. Our lives should be an open, an, an open invitation. If I'm a salty person, don't think of that in the wrong way, all right? Not salty language. I'm saying if I'm, a, if I'm a Christian and I'm trying to be salt and light, I will attract other people to me. And when they spend time with me, uh, it, it, will, it will make them say, there's something interesting there. I, I want to taste what he's got, which is the scripture comes from, Psalm 34, 8, right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. How are they going to know who, who, what that is without seeing us live a certain way? And they see that in us and want it. And it's another interesting thing about salt. It makes you thirsty. It makes you thirsty. It makes the people around you thirsty. And that's good because they're going to want to find a source to satisfy that thirst. And that's good. You, can you see why God would use these analogies? Can you see why God would pick salt of all things to compare? Why didn't he say be, I don't know, chipmunks and, and squirrels? I, he, there, there's, a, there's, there's so much value to what salt is. And he says, that's what you are. That's what you are on this earth. You're salt, right? And they're going to want to find a source that satisfies. The only thing I really want to drink when I get thirsty is water. Nothing else. Soda makes you thirstier and it's poisonous. Like there's very little. Like if I get really thirsty, all I want to drink is water. You know, even Arnold Palmer's, which are, you know, it's half, half iced tea and half lemonade or whatever. As good as that is, I just want water when I'm thirsty. And it's, <laughs> I've heard this before, have you? John chapter 4, verse 14. John chapter 4, verse 14. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That scripture's been on my heart for the last two weeks. And in fact, it keeps coming out. It came out on Wednesday night. It came out the Sunday before, I think. Uh, listen, th th this, you have a source of quenching thirst for someone. Christ will work through you if you're paying attention to what we're supposed to do, right? Salt 
causes thirst. Look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with what? Salt. So that you may know how to answer everyone. Salty Christians leave people wanting more. And that's good. That's what we're supposed to do. So salt certainly adds flavor, but the world prizes salt more than just for flavor. It was actually the most valuable component of salt is that it preserves, is that it preserves, right? Because this is before refrigeration, obviously, that, that illustrates this in scripture. still works now, though. When we live as Christians, we are preserving the world. Did you know that? Did you know that God has mercy and grace for the world and for even where you're living because if you're his child it's protecting it's protecting his wrath from coming down it's preserving the people around you right did you know that it was christians that built the first public hospitals we've done a lot of good right and not to pat ourselves on the back but it was god the list goes on it was christians that that built some of the first colleges not even in this country yet, but all around the world, it was Christians that were doing those things. Did you know that Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Oxford, did you know those were started as, as biblical institutions? Boy, they've fallen a long way now. But because of that Christian influence, because of the Christians that were here, it's affected, it's influenced, it's preserved the world from the wrath of God that will come eventually. It will come eventually, but we need to lead the way in being charitable and being merciful, all of that, all of that. In fact, that's, this is why we're taking that offering next week on the Water Sunday, but that Chris, Chris Long is, you know, uh, Eagles player. Uh, we went to this presentation, we're, we're, they're building wells. Now, now, don't misunderstand, the special offering that we take next week for Water Sunday is not uh, a regular offering. We're still going to get our regular offering. We're still going to ask you to be faithful to our missions giving. We're not, we're not ignoring those to do this. We're just asking, would you just take some time this week and pray what God would have you to do above and beyond to see what we can send them and help them in that effort. It's a good thing that they're doing and we want to be charitable. We want to be uh, kind. Christians ought to be the most generous. I've shared this before. I've worked in a couple restaurants. There's nothing worth, worse than being a waiter or something in a restaurant. I'm working and here comes this big Christian family and I'm like, I go, oh, no. You know why? Because they were cheap. Isn't that sad? That's the saddest thing ever. A Christian ought to be the most generous person in that restaurant. Honest to goodness, my brother, and I, I told this story before. Some of you may not have heard it, so I'm going to say it again. Because it still bothers me. <laughs> Brent and I, and my brother-in-law Brent, who pastors as well, were working in this place called Catfish Galley. Neither one of us ever wanted to work on a Sunday. Because here came all these people out of church, and they'd, have, they'd spend a hundred bucks on a meal and leave you a dollar. And it's like, okay, I just worked a year off of my life, but thanks for the dollar, you know, if they left it. It was just, it's terrible. We Christians should be the most generous. We should be the most charitable. We ought to be the one leading the way in giving because we know that as we give, God gives back, right? All of these things help preserve the world, and they hold back the evil so that God can continue to save people. One of my favorite verses that I read often is 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, right? The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He is coming back, as some understand slowness to be. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's stalling on purpose to see as many people come into the kingdom as he can. But part of that obligation, part of that accountability is mine. I got to be salt. I got to be salt. And there's another more personal thing that we can do to act as a preservative. Because right now I'm talking about the church at large. But the truth is, we need to be doing this on a one-on-one -on -one level. We need to be doing this with the people around us, one-on-one -on -one relationships. Nothing's more precious to God than souls. And so what are we doing to that, uh, to that end to collect them, right? Jesus asks this question. He asks this question in verse 13 of our, of, our, of our context here, chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. He says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, that's a puzzling question. And the reason it's a puzzling question is because sodium chloride is sodium chloride. It doesn't change. It actually stays pretty salty. So what's he talking about? Well, the problem was when it was mined... Even as they wrote these illustrations, when you mine salt, if it's impure, it's not salty. If it gets mixed up or messed up or other impurities get in that, get in that grinder or whenever they're processing the salt, it takes away the salinity of the salt itself. It becomes impure. It's no good anymore to do nothing except block weeds on the roads and that sort of thing, right? Uh, listen, there's a, there's, there's a bumper sticker. There's a bumper sticker that says, Jesus, save me from your followers. How sad is that? It's true, though. 
It's true though. Why? Because there's a lot of Christians who ought to be salt, but we've allowed so much other minerals and this little dust and this little bit of rock and this little bit of debris to enter into our life. Till by the end of it, it's not salt anymore. It's a whole bunch of stuff and it's terribly impure and it makes us, ra renders us rather ineffective in what we do because there's so much stuff that's not not, not shouldn't be there. The work the Holy Spirit does is the opposite. The work that the Holy Spirit does is to remove all those impurities and to say, woohoo, hello, get rid of that, get rid of this, shift this around a little bit. Let's get rid of some of those impurities to make you what? Salty again, effective again, fruitful again in the kingdom, which is what he's looking for. Let's talk about light a little bit. Talk about light. I have a lot to go through, so as you can tell, I talk really slow. I hope I'm not losing anybody. So, but let's talk about light here a little bit. This is why you can always go online, Google it, and then you can just slow it down and listen to it frame by frame and go, wait, what did he say? What? So light has a number of functions, right? Be salt, be light. Light has a number of functions. Light guides. It illuminates. It, it clarifies, right? We can light up the path. We can light up the path to the ultimate light of the world. It's like a, it's like a runway, all right? The ultimate light of the world is who? Christ. And, and if we're light and salt, as lights, we can illuminate the path to the ultimate source of light. It's like, look, when you're in an airplane, you could have, you know, you can have the navigational computer and you can have the global positioning system and all of that. But at the end of the day, if it's dark out and I'm looking out the window, I really need to see, I need to see somebody with like flowing, you know, glowy things. I need to see a runway. I need to see something. I need a little confidence of where we're landing, right? It's the same thing with lighting the path. It's the same thing with lighting the path. That's for you. That's for you and the people in your lives to act as runways, to act as people flagging other people down to say, go this way, or you're about to jump off a cliff, right? He talks about this town. The scripture talks about a town that's hidden, that cannot be hidden because it's on a hill and all of the lights, very hard to hide something like that, especially at that time. Ron Fleming, I remember we went to uh, the mission strip and he kept talking about light pollution. Remember light, light pollution? He was all excited. He was all excited when we went to the Dominican Republic because he's, he's like, it's going to be dark and it's going to be just beautiful and you can see the stars better because there's no light pollution. And then there were buses and stuff everywhere, right? It didn't quite work the way we thought. I think it was cloudy a couple times too, but anyhow, there's a truth to that. There's light pollution, kind of like fades everything else out. But the, the point is, when you're, when you're hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away, you can still see a city if it's brightly lit up, right? You can see it. It's hard to hide, right? And Jesus talked about a lamp in the house. Same thing. Same thing. They had these little clay lamps that burned olive oil in the houses. You wouldn't put a lamp under a bowl. You put it under a bowl, what happens? It goes out. You took, you took the oxygen away, Right? And this is a pet peeve of mine, but I've taught this to Julian recently. I, ha I like candles. I like my office to smell pretty nice. And so I light this candle. And I never just blow it out like that. I never blow it out like that because then all the smoke is in the room. I always seal it, right? Because that makes the flame go out and then there's no smoke, right? It's a, a pet peeve of mine. Truth, but when you take the oxygen out of it, the light goes out. Can I tell you something? The same way, you, you see where this is going? The same way that salt loses its purity and becomes unsalty, it's the same thing as us as Christians who are supposed to be light, but we're losing our oxygen because we're mixing it with impurities. And we're going out, and we're flickering, we're barely hanging in there. And God is saying, salt and light, be salt and light. It's an easy illustration to make. This kind of preaches itself. Everything you can think of that's positive about light, right? The ultimate source of light would be here, what, physically? The sun, right? The ultimate source of light is who? The sun, the real sun, S-O-N, right? Right? We're compared to the moon in scripture, actually. What does the moon do? It reflects the light of the sun. Again, see where this is going? What do we do as Christians? We reflect the light of the sun, S-O-N. Did I lose anybody? So I'll put it on Facebook later. Listen, honestly, it, we know what to do. And if we know the good to do and we're not doing it, the Bible says that's sin. Right? If I know the good to do and I'm not doing it. Jesus makes his point in verse 16, same text. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good, do, good deeds and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. That's the point. That's the point to all of it. Do you understand when, when, when Pastor Ben picks up a guitar, he's practiced, he sounds good, you know, he's yelling at the worship team to make them better and, and all of that, like he's working hard and he's doing it right. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what's it for? It's to glorify God. I can say that about him. I love that I can. I can say that about him. I hope he can say that about me. I, I, you know what my prayer is? Every Sunday, 
Every Sunday, my prayer is this. God, I, I hope that what I'm saying is pertinent. I hope I'm saying the correct thing. I pray that it's, you know, exactly what the people need to hear. I usually don't work jokes in because they're really, really terrible. But I even pray, God, if this is just really bad, give me some wisdom. And every now and then, he's let me down. And I just drop bombs. and They're awful. No, God never lets me down. I should just not say those jokes. But my biggest prayer on a Sunday or the day before a Sunday is, Lord, don't let them see me at all. My biggest prayer every Sunday, I promise you, is that God would, would render his sanction, that he would, he would bring his anointing into the words so that whether you remember who said it or not, which I couldn't care less, when you leave, it's reverberating around in your heart. Now you're at Starbucks and somebody cuts you off. Be salt and light. <laughs> Don't... <laughs> Wow. Okay, so three of you said amen. The rest of you'd be doing what? Getting into a brawl? What happened there? Listen, now you're on the highway driving. Be salt and light. Now you're at home. Now you're at home. And Susie breaks your favorite whatever. And you've told her ten times, don't touch it. But she did it again, and it broke. Be salt and light. Even at home. Right? You all know me. I am so calm. I am so, I'm so gentle and loving and patient with my kids. <laughs> Those poor kids would be like, liar, if they were in this room. But I, but I, but I try, I try. And the older I get, the older, the older th I get, the older they get, well, the older we're all getting, I guess, the older they get, the more they watch and listen and absorb and go, um, daddy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, crud, he's in the room. I shouldn't have said that. Or I shouldn't have acted that way or whatever. And it's hard because I'm as human as you are, possibly more so. And, and it's, not, it's not an easy thing for me to remember when I'm at home. Be salt and light. Be salt and light. Be salt and light. As a husband, as a father, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an employee, really, of the church, as a servant. All those things. It's hard to remember. Be salt and light. Be salt and light. Go to bed early. Get up early. Seek God. Why? Because I'm serving the church. It's my accountability. It rests on me. How can I ask you to do something I won't do? So I've, 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 I've not arrived yet. When I get there, I'll let you know. But, but we're to be salt and light in every context of our life. I wonder if Peter was thinking about what God said. Jesus said when he wrote in 1 Peter 2.12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Amen. I'm going to start to wrap it up here. I'm not sure what time it is. I don't know why I bring this watch up. I never really use it. Listen, our light needs to warm the world. Our light, who we are, it needs to bring what light brings. What does light bring? It brings comfort. It brings warmth. It brings growth. Whether it's in the, in the context of a plant and the sun and the whole photosynthesis thing going on, it needs... It need, we need to work the way the light does. And the way the light works and the way the salt works, it's effective. It's effective. There's no substitute. There's no substitute for, for light other than light. Right? You could wear those, you know, you could wear those nighttime goggles or whatever. They're awful. They don't bring comfort. But illuminate an area and oh, all of a sudden, it's comfort. How many adults would say, just tell the truth and shame the devil? How many adults are in here? You still have a nightlight. You like to sleep with a little bit of light. Oh, you poor things. Some of you are lying and should be raising their hands. There's something comforting about light. There's something comforting about light. I don't know about you, but again, I've had these jobs, right? And some of the jobs I've had were in cubicles. Oh, Lord, deliver us from cubicles. In the middle, in the middle of this giant room and the partitions. And I mean, there's not a window in sight. And you go in there, and it's like a rat in a cage. And so, and so the, so it's a wonderful thing when you walk outside. <sighs> that happens in, that happens even when I don't work, and I don't work there anymore, but it happens even in spring. Can I get an amen? When winter ends, that first spring day that you go outside, and it's like 75 degrees, and you can, <sighs> it smells like spring is starting, right? Which to me all signifies cooking on the grill, but that's not the point. The point is there's something about looking at the sun that first couple times before you run back inside and turn on the air conditioner. Like you look at the sun and there's something healing about the sun. 
There's something about that warmth. Once again, the same way God illustrates using salt, which is so valuable. I bet you McDonald's would go out of business if there was no salt. Which might not be a bad thing because they are, they are not looking out for your best interest. And if you work there, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Listen, we are to be warmth and preserving and, and life. We're to do all of that. And you can. And we can. But it all starts with what we started talking about, that you have a purpose. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? What do people see when they see your life? What do they see? Do they see salt? Do they taste salt in your words with wisdom? Do they, do they feel warmth? Do they see the light of Christ? Do they see any of that? What do they see? Well, you can't just put a salt shaker next to a steak and expect it to be seasoned. So you're in church here today and you think, I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I do, I do enough. I do enough. I, I read the word sometimes, I pray occasionally, and I'm in church relatively often, therefore I'm good. But if the salt is just sitting next to the steak, it doesn't do any good. You have to put the salt on the steak and rub it in, and it begins to melt and create a nice glaze. And then the glaze, and then when, and then, and then when the glaze hits the pan, something called the Maillard principle happens, where it browns and begins to crust up. I am starving. I don't know why this happened. Listen, but in honesty, in honesty, there's a lot of us sitting in here today, and the salt is sitting next to us. It's sitting next to us. And God is saying, you're in the right place, but you, you're, not putting any, you're, not, you're not putting any salt out. You're not putting any light out. Amen. The light has to be visible for it to do any good. Can the people see the light? I'll close with that. I end with that. Can the people see your light? Can they see it? If they can't see it, something is wrong. Sometimes, well, you know, here's the thing. Sometimes well-meaning Christians, we insulate ourselves so much that we don't know anybody that doesn't know Jesus. Everybody that we hang out with is a Christian. Now, I admit, your best friends, your intimate friends, your relationships should be Christians for that fellowship and for, to be in that. But listen, when you run into somebody, they'll only drink milk from a Christian cow. There's a problem. There's a problem. It's not very realistic. And there are people all around you that God is saying, well, take, take that guy out for a cup of coffee. Talk to him. Go next door. Talk to the neighbors, the ones that you got angry because they borrowed your lawnmower and broke it. Walk over next door and ask them if you can help them cut their lawn. And then prepare for them to drop of a heart attack. Listen, there are, there are relationships that we need to strengthen ourselves, sharpen each other. But there are relationships that God calls you to have to be effective and fruitful and influence somebody. To be salt and light. And only you can answer this. This is between you and God. You know if there's a relationship in your life that's tearing you down. That's hurting you. You're not influencing them. They're influencing you. That's not what God has called us to do. But you also know that there are some, some things that we could do to go out of our way to create time spent with somebody that might not know the Lord. You know the difference. You know the difference. Let your activities honor God, but, re but develop those relationships that will allow you to be salt and light. Amen. Let's, let's, let's close our eyes and bow our heads as we close this morning. Father, we are so thankful that the ultimate light and the ultimate seasoning has already been added to our life. God, for those of us who have a relationship with Jesus Christ in this room, we have uh, the best source of power of light, uh, of illuminating somebody else's path as well. God, will you give us a desire and a hunger uh, to have more of you that we might be more effective for the people around us? God, we thank you for your protection. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you that the umbrella of mercy is actually holding your wrath back from so many that don't know you. And so even though we pray, God, Maranatha, even though we pray, Maranatha, Jesus, come quickly, even though we pray that, we also pray, God, according to your will, in your perfect will, that you would allow for time for people to come to know you and that you would use us to do that. Help us, Jesus, to have an understanding of who we should spend time with. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I just want you to think about this for a second. Can you please just go down the Rolodex of people in your mind? Go through the list of people that you know in your heart. And just begin to ask God, put somebody on my heart. Who should I call? Who should I reach out to? Who can I encourage? Who could I be salt and light to? Jesus, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom. And Jesus, they called you a drunkard. They called you a fool. They called you a glutton. They said you're a friend to tax collectors and sinners. And you were because you love humanity. Give us wisdom to know where to be and when. Help us, God, to serve people. Help us to be your hands extended. Help us to be salt and light. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray your protection, your encouragement this morning on every person here. I pray, God, that everyone within the sound of my voice would just would hear the word of God and that it wouldn't return void, but that it would sink in to the fibers of our heart and make us more effective. Lord, we charge, we charge ourselves. We thank you for the challenge of your word. Help us to be closer to you. Help us to be salt and help us to be light. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, before I dismiss very quickly, I just want to say there's always time and always room to pray at this altar. So you're welcome to do that. And um, I just want to I leave you with this question that you've heard before, I'm sure. Many of you have heard it before already. If you were arrested and put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were arrested and put on trial for being a Christian, could they find enough evidence to convict you? Amen. God bless you. If you can be with us Wednesday, please do. If you want to sign up for a membership class, see me. The sign-up's in the back. We'll get in contact with you. Again, if you need somebody to pray with you, please let us know and we will pray.